All right, we are on the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first inaugural Pediatric Urology Fellow Online, uh, Fellow Lectures Online, P0 Flow. Uh, so uh, my name is Yi, I'm one of the uh, residents at UCSF, and I'll be moderating this first session, and uh, happy to present Dr. Hilary Kopp, uh, who'll be speaking about prenatal management of lower urinary tract obstruction. Thanks, Yi. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. We're really excited uh, to kick off this series and uh, welcome you again to P0 Flow. Um, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. We're um, happy to get this underway. I have no disclosures, um, and I hope that we all soon can be returning to uh, the things that are restorative for us and that we enjoy in life. Um, for me, that's uh, backpacking or hiking anywhere in the world, but uh, specifically spending time uh, with my partner in uh, Yosemite backpacking or along the California coast. So today we're going to talk about Ludo. Um, we'll go through some background, uh, the diagnosis, indications for prenatal intervention, options for prenatal interventions, and then disease severity-based prenatal intervention. So first of all, Ludo is rare. It occurs in about three per 10,000 pregnancies, and it occurs secondary manifestations likely related to etiology and the degree of bladder obstruction. So it can be uh, partial to complete obstruction. And we know that unrelieved obstruction causes progressive damage, including bladder, renal, and pulmonary dysfunction. And this impacts the long-term health of the fetus and the child as they get older. So we're gonna start off with a poll question. Um, when are low amniotic fluid levels secondary to LUTO first able to be detected on prenatal ultrasound? We'll go ahead and uh, give you some time to answer this and then uh, go through some of the data and look at the poll answers. So important in thinking about that question is um, where amniotic fluid comes from, and we think about that by trimester. So for the first trimester and the early second trimester, the maternal plasma ultrafiltrate uh, um, is responsible for a lot of the amniotic fluid, and then also the uh, fetal plasma transudate via the fetal skin and the umbilical cord. Fetal urine production begins around uh, 10 weeks um, with the completion of the metanephros. And then so in the second and third trimester, we see that fetal urine is a major source of the amniotic fluid. Some of the amniotic fluid is still made by fetal plasma transudate and uh, lung fluid expiration and oral nasal secretion. When are amniotic fluid levels secondary to LUTO first able to be detected on prenatal ultrasound? Let's go ahead and show the uh, poll results. At approximately 16 weeks gestation is the correct answer, and the majority of us um, answered that question correctly. So that's answer C. And so again, um, low amniotic fluid levels secondary to LUTO can be appreciated starting around 16 weeks gestation when urine becomes the major source of amniotic fluid. So urine production does begin around 10 weeks once the metanephros is formed, but amniotic fluid is still a combination of maternal plasma and fetal plasma transit. So little affects both kidney and lung development, and due to lower urinary tract obstruction, kidney dysplasia, dysplasia ensues. Um, we also see effects on lung development um, because lung development requires amniotic fluid. There's uh, theories for why this is the case. Um, it's probably more than just the presence of fluid as a stenting force. There are probably growth factors and other things that are responsible. But a very important um, part of lung development is the cannulicular phase that happens between 16 to 24 weeks. And this is the time period where it's critical for this development to occur for the fetus to survive outside of the uterus. 
Ludo has various etiologies, the most common being posterior urethral valves, and depending on the series, um, usually it ranges from about 50 to 65 percent. Other common types, um, or less common, but other types would be urethral atresia and prune belly syndrome. Um, less common, anterior urethral valves, obstructive ureter seal, and there also are some mimics of lower urinary tract obstruction. So again, looking at various series, um, this article um, uh, from Clayton and colleagues in 2014 looks at the birth prevalence of congenital luto in 284 pregnancies. And luto, um, posterior urethral valves was responsible for about 60% of luto diagnoses. And then you can see the other main causes, urethral atresia and urethral stenosis. So how do we diagnose luto? The primary tool for diagnosing LUTO is prenatal ultrasound. Bladder identification on prenatal ultrasound corresponds again with fetal urine production, which starts at around 10 weeks. These are some of the features of lower urinary tract obstruction on prenatal ultrasound. So, of course, seeing uh, megacystis, as we have here, a large bladder. We also look at bladder wall thickness. We look for the um, dilated posterior urethra, or the keyhole sign that we've all, we're, all, we're all familiar with. Also hydronephrosis, here you see the spine, and this is a good indicator looking for the kidneys on both sides, um, bilateral hydro, hydronephrosis. And then also oligo or anhydramnia, so measuring the amniotic fluid index or the deepest vertical pocket. The triad of ultrasound findings is typically described as megacystis, a dilated posterior urethra, and hydronephrosis. And those have um, usually been used um, as uh, diagnostic indicators for uh, LUDO um, by ultrasound. So the next question, which features have been shown to improve the prenatal diagnostic accuracy of LUDO? Well, authors started to look into um, the keyhole sign and how specific it was for the diagnosis of posterior urethral valves. And in 2019, they published a series, uh, 29 out of 42 suspected uh, posterior urethral valve fetuses were confirmed to have LUTO, and what they, or posterior urethral valves. And what they found was that increased bladder wall thickness and bladder dilation were associated with the diagnosis of posterior urethral valves but the keyhole sign actually did not predict posterior urethral valves. Fontanella and colleagues took this one step further in looking at improving diagnostic accuracy of posterior urethral valves, or, specific, or LUTO uh, less specifically, um, and looked at 143 cases greater than 18 weeks gestation with fetal megacystis. They found five variables with good accuracy in discriminating LUTO from other non-obstructive causes of megacystis. And these included um, fetal sex, um, severe megacystis, bilateral ureteral diameters or bilateral hydroureteral nephrosis, um, oligo or anhydramnios, and referral at less than 28 weeks. And using this clinical LUTO score, they were able to predict the risk of LUTO at 96% when they used a cutoff value of greater than 9.5. And this um, improved the area under the curve for LUTO diagnosis uh, to 0 0.84 from 0.63. Uh, when the triad of findings, megacystis, keyhole sign, or hydronephrosis are used. So question two, which features have been shown to improve the prenatal diagnostic accuracy of LUTO? So this question was, I think, until going over the, the literature, maybe um, a lot of those things um, seem to represent um, lower urinary tract obstruction. But now after reviewing um, that last article, we can see that actually E, um, does have uh, or is the correct answer. So A and C would be male sex, bladder distension, and bilateral um, hydroureter nephrosis with oligohydramnios presenting at less than 21 or 28 weeks of gestation. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll move on to indications for prenatal intervention of LUDO. Um, I think when talking about the indications, one of the most important thing is thinking about what are the goals of intervention, and this is both prenatally and postnatally. So uh, intervention can be associated with preterm delivery, so thinking about that and continuation of pregnancy, neonatal survival, long-term survival, 
pulmonary development, and of course, uh, preservation of renal function and bladder function. And prenatal counseling essentially hinges on three very important aspects of understanding the disease process, the interventions available, and then the intersection of the natural history of the disease and these interventions. And so understanding the natural history of the disease is very important so that we can help prognosticate the outcomes. Understanding how inter, um, interventions may mod modulate these disease outcomes, the risks in the, of the intervention to the mother and the fetus, and they, again, after we've intervened, how this affects survival, and then the risks associated with survival. So question three, which of the following are consistent with outcomes found among children with end-stage renal disease? We're gonna go through some of these things in just a second, but this is just sort of to get us thinking about children with end-stage renal disease. So um, if we get children to survive um, uh, postnatally, we need to be thinking about what their renal function is and what does it mean to them to have end-stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease. So overall mortality in children with end-stage renal disease is 30 times higher than uh, for children without CKD. And they have a mortality risk of about four times higher on dialysis versus transplant. Infants actually have the highest mortality rate on dialysis. There's a five-year survival if they um, start renal replacement therapy. The five-year survival starting renal replacement therapy um, at less than one year of age is 73% compared with the control group of uh, 15 to nine-year-olds on renal replacement therapy of uh, 86%. Another important thing to understand is that non-renal comorbidities, which are the case in many of um, uh, these children that are born with uh, Ludo diagnoses, have pulmonary hypoplasia, and they also can have other things like developmental delay. And these things increase the mortality among infants and children with end-stage renal disease. There are also other comorbidities that are important to consider on chronic dialysis. And uh, as we know, children born with um, poor renal function and early onset of end-stage renal disease um, are not able to be transplanted or, and do much better with transplantation once they're older, at least um, at a point where they're above 10 kilos or even bigger, preferably. And so these children are on chronic dialysis for a while, and this um, uh, is a, a huge risk for them, including cardiovascular disease. So there's a thousand times higher risk of cardiovascular death versus age-adjusted controls. They have an increased risk for cognitive and learning impairment. We see malnutrition and associated hypoalbuminemia that contribute to poor growth, as we've all seen in these patients. And then there's also other things like anemia and dyslipidemia. So for question three, the answer, which of the following are consistent with the outcomes found among children with end-stage renal disease, A is the correct answer. And so chronic dialysis in, uh, is associated with significant morbidity, including increased risk for cardiovascular disease, learning impairment, malnutrition, anemia, dyslipidemia. Non-renal comorbidities have definitely been shown to significantly increase mortality in infants and young children with end-stage renal disease. And in fact, mortality is 30 times higher among children with end-stage renal disease compared with children without chronic kidney disease. And then finally, for why um, yeah, one of the other answers is, in, is incorrect, mortality is less actually after transplant versus on kidney uh, dialysis. It's also important to um, consider the risks of minimally invasive fetal surgery. So um, these, there are risks that, to both the mother and the fetus. Um, these include premature rupture of membranes, premature birth, infection, so chorioamnitis, which is then it also places the fetus at risk, intraperitoneal amniotic fluid leakage, uh, chorioamniotic separation, placental abruption, and fetal death. Of course, there are more than these, but um, these are the most, most common. Prematurity is the principal risk factor for uh, the fetus, and infection is the primary risk, uh, maternal risk factor or risk. So it's important to understand the health issues associated with prematurity. Um, we're, we've improved it uh, um, helping these babies who are born early, uh, very prematurely, um, to survive, 
but this is not without consequences. And there are both acute and long-term consequences that um, we, we should understand for the implications of treatment and survival. These include infections of so neonatal sepsis. There's a variety of pulmonary issues from respiratory distress syndrome, apnea prematurity, infections such as pneumonia. Um, devastating consequences of prematurity such, such as intraventricular uh, ventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing uh, enterocolitis, of course, ret ret retinopathy of prematurity and jaundice. But then we see these long-term effects as well. So intellectual disabilities, behavioral problems, physical disabilities, uh, asthma from residual pulmonary issues, and other things such as tooth discoloration and even hearing impairment. These words were said back in 2001 and still ring true today. And I think it's very important. Um, so the correct selection of potential subjects for fetal therapy is important to avoid unnecessary intervention in those unlikely to survive, as well as complications related to the procedure and those that are likely to survive without any intervention. So this brings us sort of the next thing that, we're, um, that we'll talk about, and we'll start off with the true-false question. So the majority of little fetuses with normal amniotic flu fluid volumes at 24 weeks gestation have stable renal function during the first two years of life. True or false? Okay, well, to go into this a little bit further, there's a, a publication um, from NAFNET, or the North American Fetal Therapy Network, um, from 2018, uh, where their goals were to find the natural history of LUDO with normal mid-gestational amniotic fluid volumes defined as an AFI greater than nine centimeters between 20 to 24 weeks. And they were able to look at 32 consecutive patients from 11 NAFNET centers um, from 2007 to 2012 and they followed these children uh, two years postnatally. So again, they had normal amniotic fluid levels and the mean gestational um, age at presentation was uh, 23. Um, the mean AFI was uh, 15 and then none of these patients had renal cortical cysts. Over time, all of these patients that were entered into the study, again, in the beginning, they had normal amniotic fluid levels, but there was a significant increase in oligo or anhydramnios throughout gestation among these patients. So 11% did develop anhydramnios, 22% developed oligohydramnios over time. What this study showed overall was that perinatal survival was high at 97%. Um, and really, they had um, overall normal respiratory neurodevelopment and musculoskeletal outcomes. There was a requirement for renal replacement therapy in about one third of patients, and um, a, a difference in the mean creatinine and NICU, NICU discharge between those patients that had end stage renal disease versus those not requiring renal replacement therapy. And so um, the mean creatinine for um, those requiring in-stage renal disease was just a little under two versus those at discharge not requiring uh, renal replacement therapy, uh, 0.45. They looked at factors associated with worsening serum creatinine and uh, renal replacement therapy. And as you can see along the left-hand side of this um, uh, table here, these were the different factors on univariate analysis that were assessed. Uh, many of them being significant. Um, but then on multivariable analysis, the things that stayed um, significant included oligo or anhydramnios and younger gestational age at delivery. These two factors were associated with worsening creatinine. And then younger gestational age at delivery was associated for the need for renal replacement therapy. So this study was re really important for establishing that fetuses with normal amniotic fluid volumes at 24 weeks, the majority of the time are gonna have, going to have normal postnatal renal function that remains stable during the uh, first two years of life. However, there are about a third that will eventually require renal replacement therapy. Important to note that perinatality, perinatal mortality uh, is low. Um, survival rate was greater than 95%. And survival was associated with um, minimal risk of neurodevelopmental, respiratory, and musculoskeletal morbidity. On the other hand, 
fetuses with low normal amniotic fluid volume at 24 weeks did have an increased risk of renal dysfunction and actually uh, may benefit from fetal intervention. So question four, um, majority answered true. That, so the majority of little fetuses with amniotic fluid volumes at 24 weeks gestation have stable renal function during the first two years of life. And as we just saw with that paper, mid gestational normal amniotic fluid levels um, are associated the majority of the time with stable renal function during the first two years of life. There are about a third of patients who ultimately will require renal replacement therapy. So Fontanelle and colleagues took this one step further, and this is from a publication in 2019. Um, uh, they looked at 261 fetuses suspected of LUDO, and managed, these fetuses were managed conservatively. Um, uh, notably, about 110 of these, uh, or 110 um, underwent termination of pregnancy, and there was a perinatal death um, uh, rate of a 35 out of the 261 fetuses. So they studied antenatal factors associated with perinatal mortality and postnatal renal function. What they did was develop a staging system based on uh, sort of a three-tiered staging system, mild, moderate to severe, uh, based on bladder volume and gestational age at which uh, the fetus became uh, developed oligohydramnios or anhydramnios. And as you can see, the worse stage, the worse the outcome. So um, in there, this increasing stage was associated with an increase in perinatal mortality and an increase in renal uh, impairment. And essentially early gestational age at oligo or anhydramnios and an increased bladder volume is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. So knowing these things, how can we improve our ability to prognosticate? So again, we know the majority of fetuses with normal mid-gestation amniotic fluid levels do well, but fetuses who develop early oligo or anhydramnios and have increased bladder volumes have increased morbidity and mortality. But can we predict which patients will develop in-stage renal disease? Can we modulate the course or ultimately prevent in-stage renal disease? So we've tried various, uh, there's various things that we've tried. Um, obviously, uh, one thing that we would, would, would look at would be uh, urinary uh, analytes, and this would be from amniocentesis. Over time, um, these have been, ha have been studied to, to see if we can prognosticate um, renal function postnatally. Um, for context, the primary function of the fetal kidney is to clear free water. So the more dilute the urine, the better. And hence, these are sort of the standard reference ranges for where we should see the urinary analytes um, in, fetus, in fetuses after amniocentesis. Unfortunately, this really hasn't panned out. And to sort of summarize the literature, this is uh, from a systematic review of 23 articles. Um, looking at fetal urine analysis to predict poor postnatal renal function in cases of um, congenital LUDO. And essentially the current evidence demonstrates that none of the analytes of fetal urine accurately predict poor postnatal renal function. Going in a, a step further, um, Ruano and colleagues looked at whether or not ultrasound renal aspects are associated with urine biochemistry in fetuses with lower urinary tract obstruction. And they looked at 31 consecutive little fetuses uh, with vesicocentesis for uh, fetal urinary biochemistry and renal ultrasound from 2013 to 15. And they compared the urinary indices and the uh, ultrasound characteristics. And what they found was that, was that there was no association between ultrasound findings and fetal urine indices. So if you look along the top, are the these are the various urinary analytes that were assessed. And along the side um, column here, um, the various characteristics on renal ultrasound that um, we look for on uh, prenatal ultrasound. So echogenicity of the kidneys, whether cysts are present, dysplasia, hydrouretor nephrosis, and of course, uh, amniotic fluid levels. And there was no correlation between the findings on ultrasound and the urinary analytes. So um, this study uh, essentially concluded that the uh, renal ultrasound characteristics and urinary biochemistry uh, should both be taken into account. I think though that 
we're going to see this evolve hopefully and over time find better markers for predicting in stage renal disease and recently a, um, a study out of france has been published um, in 2018 looking at the urinary metabolome and the peptidome um, and creating a biomarker panel to help identify risk for early in stage renal disease they were able to actually analyze urine from 60 um, posterior nuchal valve fetuses from 1997 to 2009. This was a multi-center uh, study from France. They use, used emerging technology, so it's capillary electrophoresis that's coupled to mass spectrometry. Um, and they actually, um, using 12 urinary um, peptides and 24 metabolites um, to create a marker panel, they were able to predict postnatal onset of early end-stage renal disease in posterior uterine valve fetuses. Um, so this is really exciting. Um, it's you know not prime time yet. It, this is a study that's been done on it from uh, one group, um, and uh, also is again technology that is available in the research world, but is not clinically available at this time. But I think that this is this is where hopefully the field will go for us to do a better job of predicting in whom we see um, in stage renal who we're going to see in stage renal disease in uh, postnatally. So what are the options for prenatal intervention for lower urinary tract obstruction? Um, we're gonna talk about the two main options, so vesicle amniotic shunting and fetal cystoscopy. I have these two pictures here because I think they're important um, to demonstrate that you have to commit to what you're doing before, you're, before you proceed because you can't convert from one uh, technique to another. Um, uh, essentially, you see that the approach is very different. And um, for vesicle amniotic shunting, it's happening uh, right in the suprapubic area versus with fetal cystoscopy, you're entering in through the dome of the bladder. And, and uh, we know that from procedures we're doing um, uh, all the time postnatally, if we're um, approaching the uh, bladder neck in an anterograde fashion. So there are two main types of uh, vesicle amniotic shunts currently available, um, the rocket shunt and the Harrison fetal bladder shunt. Um, the picture on the left is to sh uh, shows uh, stunt, uh, stent placements. So you see the stent coiled in the fetal bladder and then nicely placed within the amniotic sac. Um, this uh, is what you would really, you're hoping to see. One thing that is really important to point out also is, again, you're intervening in these children who have oligo or anhydramnios. And so the amniotic membrane in the, in the abdominal wall of the fetus, uh, there's no space. And so often in order to do vesicle amniotic shunting, it, a second procedure is required ahead of time, which would be amnio infusion in order to create that uh, space to deploy the uh, amniotic, the vesicle amniotic shunt. So we're going to go to our next question. What is the leading cause of perinatal mortality in infants born with severe lower urinary tract obstruction? I'm going to follow that up with an, another question because we're going to go over these things in the slides that are coming. So which of the following has been demonstrated with fetal intervention? Okay. So that leads us to a discussion um, um, involving the Pluto trial, or the percutaneous vesicoamniotic shunting versus conservative management for fetal lower urinary tract obstruction. The primary outcome in this trial was survival of the baby to 28 days postnatally. Uh, they enrolled 31 fetuses. Um, this was a, a multinational study, um, so the UK, Ireland, and the Netherlands. The median gestational age at shunt placement was 19.7 weeks. And very important, um, this study was closed early due to poor recruitment. And so um, their goal was to recruit over 150 patients. And as you can see here, they were only able to recruit 31 patients from multiple countries uh, with multiple institutions. 
Um, we'll take a look at the survival outcomes from the Pluto trial and we'll first focus on the intent, uh, intention to treat analysis. So there were a total of 24 uh, live births, uh, 12 in each group, so 12 in the vesicular amniotic shunt group and 12 in the conservative management group. 12 total was survival to 28 days. So all 12 neonatal deaths that occurred were secondary to pulmonary hypoplasia. And the, as you can see, the 28-day survival uh, was greater in the vesicle amniotic shunting group, so eight versus the conservative management patients with four. Uh, this was not significant. And then if we look at the as-treated analysis, um, the 28-day, one-year, and two-year survival is, um, does show significant, a higher rate of um, survival uh, for those that receive vesicle amniotic shunting. But I think it's important to consider there's a very high likelihood for confounding by indication. And um, there's a complementary uh, publication using data from the Pluto registry that I would encourage you to read um, as um, it highlights uh, this issue. So the, uh, let's look at the two-year outcomes. So remember, 31 patients were enrolled. At two years, there were 10 surviving patients. Um, Two patients, both within the shunt group, survived to two years with normal renal function, and one patient um, had significant cognitive impairment. When we're talking about vesicular amniotic shunting, it's important to, uh, to know the complications. Again, there were 16 patients that were stratified to this arm, but we all only talk about 15 when we talk about complications because one of these patients had a non-treatment-related termination of pregnancy. So uh, seven complications occurred in six patients, a little under 50%, and these were secondary to spontaneous rupture of membranes, uh, shunt blockage, shunt dislodgement, and four out of the 15 um, vesicular amniotic shunt pregnancies were lost. Three of these were from spontaneous rupture of membranes and one shunt blockage. So in conclusion, there was a higher survival in fetuses who received vesicle amniotic shunting, but in the intention to treat analysis, this was not significant. Um, the probability of normal renal function is low, whether or not shunting or conservative management is performed, and complications with vesicle amniotic shunting are common. There's also recently uh, been a systematic review and meta-analysis um, that was published in 2017 looking at the effectiveness of vesicle amniotic shunt in fetuses with congenital lower urinary tract obstruction. And they reviewed nine studies comprising with 112 fetuses in uh, comparing vesicle amniotic shunting with no intervention. There was an increase in perinatal survival with uh, 2.5 times the odds of survival versus no intervention. But there was no difference in six-month, 12-month, or two-year survival, and no difference in postnatal renal function, whether or not shunting was performed or no intervention was performed. So question five, which is the leading cause of perinatal mortality in infants born with severe ludo? And 96% of you got it right, that's awesome. So uh, pulmonary insufficiency. And as we saw from the LUDO trial, all 12 neonatal deaths were, happened because of pulmonary insufficiency. That's not to say that renal failure isn't a huge issue and, a, and responsible for significant morbidity and mortality, but the distinction is perinatal or neonatal mortality. The other two were distractors. So necrotizing enterocolitis and intraventricular hemorrhage are big issues and are especially increased in um, premature and extremely premature babies. And then for question six, which of the following has been demonstrated with fetal intervention? Um, so we're a, a little bit more spread on this. The correct answer is C. And now as we can see after reviewing um, those studies, really the, the main thing that uh, fetal intervention has shown is improved perinatal survival. It does not improve perinatal renal function. It does not improve long-term renal function. And we certainly know that the risk of complications with intervention are high, both maternal for the, the mother and the fetus. Okay, so we'll start off the next section with a new polling question. True or false, the preferred method of fetal intervention for lower urinary tract obstruction is vesicoamniotic shunting. <laughs> 
Okay. So to talk a little bit more about this, um, we're gonna review a paper by Ruano and colleagues uh, from 2015 um, that looked at 111 fetuses with severe ludo from 1990 to 2013, undergoing fetal cystoscopy, so in 34 patients, vesicle amniotic shunting in 16 patients and no intervention in 61 patients. And they did a multivariable analysis to determine predictors of survival and normal, normal renal function at six months. They found that gestational agent diagnosis, method of intervention, and ludo etiology were associated with prognosis. So there was an improved six month survival with intervention versus without intervention, both for fetal cystoscopy and vesicle amniotic shunting with an adjusted relative risk of just a little under two for both of those. In addition, fetal cystoscopy and vesicle amniotic shunting improved six month survival among posterior urethral valve patients. So again, what the underlying cause of ludo is matters. And we did, they did not see any improvement uh, in uh, survival for patients with urethral atresia. This same group also looked at two-year outcomes after diagnostic and therapeutic fetal cystoscopy for lower urinary tract obstruction. And there were 50 fetal cystoscopies performed for ludo. Uh, 31 of these had valves, uh, 14 urethral atresia, and five with stenosis. And they again found survival depended on diagnosis with about half of patients with valves surviving, none with atresia, and one out of the five with stenosis surviving. The main conclusions of this article were that fetal, cyst fetal cystoscopy is accurate for determining ludo etiology, and that's one of the biggest advantages for doing fetal cystoscopy. So when you're selecting the type of prenatal intervention, there's pluses and minuses to both, and we've touched on some of these, but to review. So vesicoamniotic uh, shunting, the positives, it's technically easier and less invasive. It does majority of the time require an amnio infusion in order to deploy the vesicoamniotic shunt. And there are a number of co um, complications um, in addition to just intervention, uh, uh, prenatal intervention, there, is, there are complications specific to the shunt, which include dislodgement, malplacement, blockage, et cetera. For cystoscopy, um, the positives are that it provides a diagnosis. And so this um, allows you to, if there, we know that urethral atresia patients do very badly, um, and, and the majority of series show that they don't survive. And so, um, uh, it's very helpful for counseling. It also is a more physiologic treatment, so it's similar to the valve blade. It's technically much more different types of complications uh, that can be big issues postnatally, um, such as urethral fistula. Um, and 20% of the time, the ludo recurs, and so um, there can be a need for a second intervention. So, for question seven, the true-false question, the preferred method of fetal intervention of ludo is best for amniotic shunting. So actually, um, one method isn't particularly preferred over the other, and a lot of it depends on the comfort of the but I do know that vesicoamniotic shunting is um, technically easier to perform. Again, does require the amnio infusion um, prior to doing it the majority of the time. Um, cyst fetal cystoscopy and ablation of valves is definitely a more challenge, technically challenging procedure, uh, but the advantages for, for um, fetal cystoscopy and ablation are potentially, you know, nailing down the diagnosis, is it truly ludo, and is it actionable? And also potentially there may be some advantage to returning to a more physiologic state by ablating the valves. Okay, the final thing that we'll talk about is disease severity-based prenatal intervention of lower urinary tract obstruction. So we're gonna center our, our conversation around a report actually from a multidisciplinary SFU or Society for Fetal Urology panel discussion uh, that occurred at the 2016 Fall Congress. And um, the, this uh, panel discussion was then um, published by um, uh, 
uh, Farouja and colleagues. And um, we're gonna specifically look into the outcomes reported by Ruana's group that uses a Ludo classification system uh, in 26 patients that were treated at the Texas Children's in 2016. So Ruano's classification system um, uh, helps um, define fetal intervention by disease severity. Um, so the three stages from stage one, mild Ludo, stage two, moderate, stage three, severe Ludo. And then as you can see along the left-hand side, um, these characteristics help then uh, place patients into categories and define um, whether or not uh, their fetal intervention um, uh, is indicated and then also provides a way to analyze results of fetal intervention by severity. Um, and again, the, uh, we'll go into some detail about each of these stages, but we're looking at amount of amniotic fluid, echogenicity in the fetal kidneys, renal cortical cysts, renal dysplasia, and um, uh, Ruana's group does use uh, urine biochemistry or urine analytes. So for stage one mild ludo, fetal intervention is not indicated. Um, it, is, um, it includes observation with weekly, weekly ultrasounds. Mild disease is supported by the absence of progression to cysts or dysplasia on renal imaging. And with continued urine production, i.e. the amniotic fluid levels have not dropped, uh, lung hypoplasia is unlikely. There's also the option to intervene if a stage one Ludo patient progresses to stage two. For stage two Ludo or moderate disease, fetal intervention is indicated with the thought to permit lung development and potentially prevent severe renal impairment. Um, Oligohydramnios after 18 weeks, we know um, without signs of renal cysts or signs of dysplasia, um, may indicate that there's severe ludo, but that we potentially could um, continue to preserve renal function. And, and to do so, that would require intervention either with um, vesicular amniotic shunting or uh, fetal cystoscopy with the, uh, ablation of valves. And then for stage three ludo, intervention um, is possible to attempt uh, prevention of pulmonary hypoplasia, although the evidence is lacking for this. Um, and it is important to note that renal damage is irreversible already at this stage with, with renal cysts and dysplasia and increased echogenicity. So usually anhydramnios uh, or severe oligo um, and hyperechoic kidneys with cysts and dysplasia are how these patients are presenting. So it is possible to place a shunt or perform uh, vesicular um, uh, or, or uh, amnio infusion in these patients, um, but at many centers, um, this would not be done. So um, outcomes were assessed by little classification. And uh, as you can see here, vesicle amniotic shunting was performed uh, in stage two and three, so uh, across the top line. So no patients in stage one had vesicle amniotic shunting. All of the patients in stage two and 47% um, of the patients uh, with stage three had vesicle amniotic shunting. There was no difference between stages in gestational age at delivery. So that's getting at uh, complications of preterm delivery with intervention. Um, and there, but there were significant differences between stages in mortality and in stage renal disease. If we look at renal outcomes by Ludo classification, so dialysis dependence varies by the Ludo stage. So at two years, um, stage one, no patients were dialysis dependent versus at uh, stage two, 18%, and stage three, 100%. Among non-dialysis dependent patients, the uh, EGFR uh, glomerular filtration rate was similar. And then looking at renal survival, which was defined in this study as death or need for dialysis, uh, this what, there was a difference based on Ludo stage. So at, uh, there was 100% survival among those with stage one or mild Ludo, 70% three-year survival for those with stage two Ludo, and 0% two-year survival for those with stage three Ludo. So this study 
does um, offer utility in risk stratification to guide fetal intervention um, and potentially assess outcomes. For stage one, there's low risk for mortality and significant renal dysfunction and early infancy. So it's very unlikely that they would benefit from intervention, similar to the study that we looked at for the natural history of patients that present with mid-gestational uh, normal amniotic fluid levels. For stage two, or moderately though, it does appear that there's some benefit of intervention to reduce neonatal mortality and the incidence of early onset in stage renal disease. And then for stage three, there's no to little benefit um, for intervention as the outcomes are poor for survival and regardless in stage renal disease is very high. So let's do a polling question at this point. Um, which patient would benefit the most from prenatal intervention? And we'll sit here for a while and let you look at these answer choices and then we'll actually immediately go to a discussion of um, the best answer. Okay, so if we can bring up the poll. Good, so there's some uh, ma majority, so um, did answer uh, the correct answer, which is A, but this is an opportunity for us to discuss this uh, further and uh, really kind of hone in on the um, importance of this. So answer a uh, is a fetus with an enlarged bladder bilateral hydrourethral necrosis with normal echogenicity no renal cysts favorable urine favorable urinary analytes and oligo at 20 weeks gestation so this is actually the patient that would benefit the most they're classified as a stage uh, two ludo patient using the Rowano classification system and they have the most to gain with intervention to reduce mortality um, as they have an early onset of in-stage um, in stage renal disease and uh, our higher incidence of that. So intervention will allow for amniotic fluid levels to increase to improve and assist with pulmonary development. And intervention can take place early enough that it may help to prevent severe renal impairment. As for why we wouldn't choose choice B, um, evidence has demonstrated that the majority of the fetuses with normal mid-gestational fluid levels have favorable postnatal renal function that remains stable for the first two years of life. So again, this is, this is a, um, a fetus with an enlarged bladder, bilateral hydronephrosis, normal epigenicity, no renal cysts, and importantly, normal amniotic fluid levels. So again, as we've learned, those patients tend to do well regardless of what you do. In other words, don't intervene because they tend to still have um, favorable outcomes. For C, enlarged bladder, bilateral hydrogen nephrosis with increased echogenicity, cysts, oligo, unfavorable urinary analytes, and 24 weeks gestation. So this fetus will likely not benefit from intervention given that the fetus is already past the canalicular phase of lung development that ends at 24 weeks. So we're not gonna really help the, the lungs. And then the, the kidneys are already showing that they have uh, damage, so and, and issues with development, increased echogenicity and renal cysts. So intervening in these could risk preterm labor and there's likely very little benefit in them. However, there would be some that would choose to intervene. D, um, enlarged bladder, bilateral hydrourethral nephrosis with normal echogenicity and unilateral renal cyst with oligo at 30 weeks gestation. So the risk for preterm labor with intervention in this fetus outweighs any benefit of intervention at this stage. So uh, this, is, this is a fetus who we want to stay um, uh, in the womb longer to help with development and avoid the risks of prematurity. The lungs are past development. There's not gonna be an effect for the kidneys. And so really intervention at this stage is more risk than benefit to this fetus.
Okay, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, first of all, Ludo, lower urinary tract obstruction is rare. Uh, posterior urethral valves is the most common cause and in most series we'll see it range from about being responsible from about 50% up to 65% of cases. We know that unrelieved obstruction causes progressive pulmonary and renal damage. Accurate diagnosis is critical. So male sex, bladder distension, bilateral ureteral dilation, oligo or anhydramnios, and gestational age of referral less than 28 weeks all help with diagnosis of LUDO. There are significant maternal and fetal risks to minimally invasive prenatal intervention and selection for intervention is important. So we need to think about those who are most likely to benefit. Um, so those most likely to benefit are if they have oligo or granules, severe necrosis, and an absence of any kidney cysts or dysplasia. And remember, the majority with normal amniotic fluid levels at 24 weeks do well without any intervention at all. And so really an intervention is just um, piling on risk for them. So in conclusion, again, data do not support one intervention uh, over another. Uh, the main advantage of cystoscopy versus vesicular amniotic shunting is to provide diagnosis and allow for better selection of candidates for fetal intervention. There's also, again, some thought that maybe this intervention um, is more physiologic or returning to a more physiologic state. Um, importantly, intervention has shown improved perinatal survival but no difference in long-term survival or postnatal renal function. For future directions, we need continued research to identify predictors and modifiable risk factors associated with disease progression and severity, and further study to evaluate, evaluate long-term outcomes of selective intervention based on disease severity. And that'll do it, thanks. Great. Thanks, Dr. Kopp, for a, a great lecture. Uh, we were getting a lot of feedback about how nice it is uh, to have your interactive questions. Um, there are a few questions here that are popping up. I don't know if you want me to read them or do you want to just read them and answer them in the Q&A? Uh, go, go ahead, Dee. That's fine. Okay. Um, so one question we're getting is in patients with suspected valve, how early do you catheterize him postnatally and do you use a catheter feeding tube or stent? What's your sort of initial management? Yeah, good question. So um, we catheterize as soon as we have access to the child. So often these, we have frequently babies being born here, but also at outside hospitals. And if they are born at an outside hospital, we ask that the catheter uh, is placed prior to transfer. Um, and we do use a feeding tube, in other words, uh, and, and not a Foley, not anything where you're blowing up uh, a balloon, as that can, in a hypertrophied bladder, block the ureteral orifices. So you really want to make sure that you're not, um, uh, that you're placing a, a feeding tube. Great. Uh, there was a question um, about sort of the intravesical versus amniotic pressures. Do we know what the relationship is and how effective a stent is uh, when placed um, between the two? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know those data, um, but that would be something that's interesting uh, to, uh, to look into. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think. <laughs> we, we can look, look into that. Um, there's a question about if the underlying etiology of LUDO has been studied in terms of outcomes with intervention in stage two. Uh, this person is asking because they don't see a value of even trying fetal cystoscopy in case you end up finding urethral atresia, so it's fine to do nothing then because it won't matter. Yeah, um, so I think that that question is kind of two-part in some ways. So, um, mo most of the time, urethral atresia patients um, are going to be in a severe little category anyways um, because of the, the, the severe presentation because of the blockage. Um, that, that's not always the case. And so there is some value in understanding um, what the pathology is. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, fetal cystoscopy does provide information. Great. There's a question about how you approach your discussion in these cases. 
with one parents of fetuses who may benefit from fetal intervention and two parents of fetuses who would likely not benefit but want something done. So those who would benefit and those who wouldn't. Yeah, so first of all, I think it's really important to, to emphasize that these are multidisciplinary um, um, discussions and a multidisciplinary team. And so uh, where we meet and discuss these patients ahead of time, and then um, we'll each um, we'll talk about, uh, come to a conclusion about what we feel based on the evidence is best for the fetus and the mother. Um, and then um, we then meet with the family um, and the mother um, and talk about uh, the findings and, and place them in context. So we're, you know, it's really important, I think, for families to be able to make educated decisions. They, and everybody comes to the table with different preferences and certain things that they will or will never do. And so there, th those factors are, are all considered. There are some people who do want to try intervention at any cost. So there may be stage three Ludo patients who we know have a very poor chance of survival, but the, the parents really um, want to try an intervention. So um, that everything is fully disclosed and, and um, potentially we would discuss uh, intervention, although we would make sure that um, it's very clear that the chance of survival and the chance of renal function, regardless of what we do, is very poor. And they, it's also, we talked about earlier in, in the talk, these all also need to be placed into a, a postnatal context. So it's not just about survival prenatally. Um, these are very sick kids and they have not only acute issues when they're born, but they have long-term issues with implications. Um, and it's not just about surviving peritoneal dialysis and infections and all of these different things, but in stage renal disease, um, until you can get a transplant, um, in, in many ways, uh, has multiple you know, morbidities and um, uh, a high mortality rate, uh, but also even once you have a transplant, I think there's a lot of work to do in that area as well, looking at psych psychosocial outcomes. And so uh, it's very important for us to paint the entire picture and make sure that families are making decisions, um, informed uh, decisions when we do this. You still there, you? Oh, I think you may have frozen. I'll see if there's any more questions that I can answer. We have a few more minutes. Um, let's see. So a uh, great question about bladder function, <laughs> he's back. A great question about bladder function postnatally. Are there any studies on the, of these issues and how prenatal intervention affects that? Excellent question. Um, there aren't a lot of studies on this. Um, uh, we do know that um, there are some studies, a recent publication by Daryl McLeod and colleagues from the Puma Alliance looking at postnatally um, serum or creatinine and how that predicts um, long-term renal replacement therapy and need for clean intermittent catheterization. Um, and certainly serum or creatinine uh, is associated with um, eventual uh, need for uh, clean intermittent catheterization. But I think more specifically to your question, how, how could prenatal inter intervention potentially help bladder function? And I think this still needs to be sorted out. There's another question here. What do you think of amnio infusion for stage three fetuses to try to prevent pulmonary hypoplasia? Great question. And if, I think that the RAC trial, um, so that's an amnio infusion trial in children or in fetuses with bilateral renal agenesis is gonna tell us a lot. Um, right now, we don't, we don't really have that information to know yet how it affects uh, outcomes. And I kind of alluded to this earlier uh, for lung development. Um, I think it's more than just stenting of the lungs because of the, the presence of amniotic fluid. There's likely other growth factors and things that we're still not aware of. I suspect that amnio infusion um, these, in these severe um, uh, ludo cases, if done early enough, could be helpful. But I think um, 
uh, you know, we, we need to wait to see what the RAF trial tells us. Great. Uh, Dr. Cobb, I think we are just wrapping up on time. Um, are we planning to publish these Q&As as well, so, like the COVID lectures? Yes, right. So any of these questions, um, I'll formally answer and post, and I'll also, also post um, answers from the polling questions uh, to make sure that yeah, you can go back and look at those as well. So uh, thank you again. It's been a pleasure to uh, to initiate the PGRO flow series and we're really excited about this and hope that we can continue this beyond um, COVID and maybe this will be one of those silver linings from this uh, period of time. Thanks Yi and also a really special uh, shout out to Christy and Michelle for doing an amazing job of pushing to get this up and running for us. Great, thanks Care everyone for joining us. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow, uh, same time. Stay well, everybody. Take care.